I have something wonderful for you in this session. I want to look at the subject of God's love for all mankind. This would be part one, I guess, where we focus on the Old Testament. I want to use as our text scripture, Psalm 98, verses 2 and 3. The Lord has made known his salvation, his righteousness he has revealed in the sight of the nations. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Now that's quite a claim. Quite a claim to make about how God, in his abilities, his infinite abilities, has reached all the ends of the earth. Now, of course, you may have asked the question, and I certainly did uh, back in the day, when I was filled with doubt and unbelief, and at times of weakness, I said, you know, how, how can everyone on the face of the earth um, get a fair shot at accepting Jesus if we believe that that's what's needed? So, I want to make the following statement and declare that God's heart for the lost has been the same in both the Old and the New Testament. We certainly see it clearly revealed in the New Testament that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and you've got the cross and, and the evangelization of the world uh, subsequent to that. Jesus gave instructions to disciples to reach out to all the ends of the earth in the New Testament. But what about the Old Testament? What about the people in Africa, Asia, South America, Far East, uh, Japan, Australasia, wherever? In the Old Testament, what does the Old Testament have to say in answer to the question, what about those people? Now, obviously, it's a hypothetical question that's very often used to question the veracity of God's word, integrity of God's word. As if God's going to unfairly judge people who have supposedly never heard his plan for their salvation. Now, I hope to show in this session that the Bible record shows that God has lovingly reached out to all mankind at all times in all sorts of ways. Two of which, number one, through the creation that he made. He made the world and so when people genuinely ask the question, you know, how does this all come about and what does it mean and... Just look at it from that point of view. And then secondly, that inner hunger or thirst for eternal meaning. Where do we come from? What am I here for? Where am I going? Etc. I believe those are two key areas that we shouldn't neglect. But the focus of this session is looking at Old Testament examples of God using his called out or chosen people, the Jews in this particular case, and, and even before the Jews Jewish nation was instituted, how God reached out and touched the lives of people in the Old Testament. Let me read this psalm to you, very close to the other one, Psalm 96, close to Psalm 98, which we use as our text. And it's a beautiful call to God's people and the whole earth. Now, obviously, if God inspired this psalm, the psalmist, to write this, he intended for the whole earth to hear it. He used ears to hear, let him hear it. So if you've got ears to hear this psalm, I'm going to read it to you. From verses 2 through to 9, Psalm 96. And this is the psalmist's call to believers to proclaim God's salvation among the nations. Quote, Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be a feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name, Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. It looks like God has an inclusive view of reaching the nations. Excuse me. And so uh, let's continue. God reaches out in the Old Testament. 
Number one example that I want to share with you is the story of Noah. Noah and the ark. Now Noah was used by God to save mankind in this ark, an incredible uh, feat of uh, nautical engineering when, when scientists uh, honestly look at it. It's just amazing what the ark uh, was and did do and could do. But Noah um, was used by God, as I said, to save mankind after preaching righteousness to them for many, many years. People came, obviously, to have a look at what was going on, and Noah preached to them while he worked. We have a record of this in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, and certainly in the Genesis account in chapters 6 and 7. But the record does show before 2500 BC that God's Spirit had been striving with them, quote unquote, striving with them. All the peoples of the earth had been striving with them to bring them to a point of repentance. And he was using Noah preaching righteousness, and then when the all shake out took place and the flood came, um, they basically brought judgment upon their own heads. They continued an absolute rebellion and stubbornness brought judgment on their own heads. It's not that God was itching to smoke them or drown them in this case, but uh, it was their rebellion and stubbornness that brought this judgment. God was there, in fact, we can say, all the time reaching out to him through Noah's preaching as he built the ark. Noah was a preacher of righteousness, God's righteousness in Christ is his gift to mankind, even in those Old Testament times. So, that said, let's move on to number two. God's heart is for all the nations and people groups, as we've seen from the Psalms readings earlier on. But let's have a look at something else here. God called out the Jews as a nation to be his witness to the whole world. Now, a lot of people don't understand this and don't maybe know about this, but the Jewish nation began with Abraham, who's called the father of the faith. And God calls him out of Ur of the Chaldees in about 2091 BC. Now, Ur of the Chaldees is in modern day Iraq. And um, the people at that time, historically, um, it is scholars have claimed that they were mostly moon worshippers and uh, not worshippers of a true God, but yet God was able to reach into that situation and call out Abram, which, who, who later received the name Abraham, to be the father of faith. And this is what we have recorded for us in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 and 3. 1 to 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. Now, isn't this interesting? God will bless him first, and then he's going to translate this blessing into blessing other people. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So that's God's heart for all the families of the earth, the ethnos or the people groups of the earth. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verses 6 through to 8 says this about the Jewish people now. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Now there was a purpose behind this. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you, so it was initiated in his heart. It wasn't um, in response because of the inherent goodness or the largeness of the Jewish people. But it was um, inherent in the heart of God because the Lord loves you. And because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Now, this Deuteronomy passage is in the time of Moses. And Moses takes place, this whole incident with Moses leading the people out of the, the land of Egypt takes place um, as part of God's people that God put into place through Abram. I hope that doesn't confuse you there. But Abram or Abraham, later to be called, um, when you trace the lineage down, you get to Moses. 
And then you get to Moses leading the people out of Israel, and God explains things here, that he's chosen these people to be a people for himself so that they can be a witness and a blessing to the rest of the world. So God chose Israel as a nation to be a witness of his existence and, as a, and also as a vehicle of blessing. Now, incidentally, as a third example here of God's heart for all the nations, we've got a character by the name of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek is a priest of the Most High. That's how he's defined in Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 through 20. And Melchizedek was at the time of Abraham. So we're jumping up and down here in the narrative, the time scale of the narrative a little bit. But nevertheless, Melchizedek um, had tithes paid to him by Abraham, the patriarch. Genesis 14, verse 18 reads, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, he was priest of God Most High. Interestingly enough, God had priests going at that time. This is way before Moses and Aaron and the priesthood of the tabernacle at that time. He had this character by the name of Melchizedek, who was the high priest at that time. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by Most High. God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Now, incidentally, this Melchizedek was the king of Salem, which is modern-day Jerusalem, and he serves bread and wine, or the communion elements as we know them today in the New Covenant, to Abraham, and also expresses his strong belief in the creator God who gave victory to Abraham over his enemies. So, here the hand of God is evident in the life of Abraham and Melchizedek, who appears you know, in the narrative um, out of nowhere, so to speak. And this, to me, um, tells me that there were obviously other priests in that area that God had raised up before Abraham arrived on the scene. So God was alive and well and reaching people of all different backgrounds at that time, too, as evidenced by the story. You need to stop and think about it a little bit. I'm not going to tease out every detail in this um, session. But having said that, let's move on to a fourth example here. More specifically, Moses being called by God to deliver the Israelites from Egyptian bondage after initially messing up, you know, as Moses did, and then spending 40 years in the wilderness of Sinai, and then over into what is northwest uh, Saudi Arabia today, and where he had met Jethro, the priest of Midian, Interestingly enough, um, his father-in-law Jethro, because he marries his daughter Zipporah, uh, Jethro was a priest of Midian who lived with his family there. But, uh, you know, uh, later on, after Moses had done his thing in Egypt and led the people out of Egypt, in 4, 1446 BC, Moses leads the Jews out of Egypt. He meets up with Jethro again who's in the wilderness area, and he hears the story and rejoices. This is now a quote now from the Bible, in Exodus 18, verse 9. Jethro now rejoicing, for all the goodness which the Lord has done to Israel. So he's referring to uh, God as the Lord. So when, he, when we talk about Jethro, the priest of Midian, he, he already has made a connection with God. And this is independent of Moses and the Jews and and the law, and you know, all the stuff that we know about Moses. Interesting, interesting. And he also praises God in verse 10 of that same chapter in Exodus, and he says, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians. So God has obviously been able to reach the Midianites. Uh, Jethro is a priest of Midian, remember. And uh, Midianites were, were a Gentile nation. They were out there in, in Saudi Arabia area. Interesting. Reaches into the heart of these Gentile people. Moving right along here. Number five, Rahab, the Gentile prostitute of Jericho. Now, this is uh, taking the story a little bit further, somewhat in sequence here with Joshua and Caleb, who are now going to uh, lead this attack on the city of Jer Jericho, just on the other side of the River Jordan, after the Jews had wandered around for 40 years. But this Gentile prostitute believes and helps the Israeli spies, Joshua and Caleb, hide from the authorities when they were spying out the Promised Land earlier on in 1406 BC. And when the attack comes, she and her family are saved when Jericho is raised to the ground. 
She later marries Salmon, the son of Nashon, a prominent prince of Israel, one of the leaders, and becomes, in the lineage story, an ancestor of the Messiah Jesus, according to Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 through to 21, and chapter 6, verses 17 and 25. Now, I'll give you these references, and I'm zooming through them, because the story is there of how God used a Gentile to further his purposes. So he'd obviously spoken to her heart through, um, through the influence of, of his, uh, his spirit when she met up with Joshua and Caleb, a Gentile. So Rahab the Gentile is involved in the story. So God's in the business of reaching all sorts of people, not just the Jews, not just blessing them, but now blessing people of, of all sorts of reputation. In her case, she was a prostitute in, in all likelihood. Now we get down to um, our sixth example, King Solomon, David's son. That's King David's son. Um, he's visited uh, during his 40-year reign by the Queen of Sheba. And Sheba comes from the modern... Um, part of Africa um, that, that is way south of current Israel, Palestine, whatever you want to call it. Now this takes place in 946 BC. And what had happened is Solomon had built up the Jewish kingdom so much so that its direct influence stretched at least as far as modern day Yemen, which has been in the news in the year 2015, and Ethiopia in northern Africa. Now, when we read in 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 1 through to 9, we have this account of the Queen of Sheba. Now, when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. So she had her, her questions, and they were hard questions. She came all the way from Africa through to Israel and Jerusalem, where Solomon was, and... Uh, she, she came with a very great retinue, which the scripture goes on to say. Let me continue reading. She came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue, with camels that bore spices, very much gold and precious stones. When she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. So Solomon answered all her questions. He obviously had the wisdom of God operating and flowing through him. And there was nothing so difficult for the king that he could not explain it to her. That's, God was using him to, to, to impact the known world at that time. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he'd built, the food in his table, the seating of his servant, the service of his waiters and their apparel, his cupbearers and the entryway with you, which he went up to the house of the Lord, the temple there, there was no more spirit in her. She was just overwhelmed and impressed by this, this whole business. Then she said to the king, it was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. So the influence of the Lord had stretched all the way down to where she was, and now she was, is responding and coming up to him to, 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 to ask these questions. However, I did not believe the words until I came and saw with my own eyes. And indeed, the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity exceeded the fame which I heard. Happy are your men and happy are, your, are these your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. And look at the end comment that she makes. Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you, setting you on the throne of Israel, because the Lord has loved Israel forever. Therefore, he made you king to do justice and righteousness. Now, she confesses him as Lord, describing him as your God, but the implication is that he, God is making such an impression on her life that um, it's significant to note. And uh, yes, she's the queen. She has a lot of influence in her land and a lot of um, uh, impact, surely, when she gets back in town. 1 Kings chapter 10 uh, brings us a little bit more here in verses 23 and 24. So King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth. Now, get that. All the kings of the earth. This is a comment made by the writer of 1 Kings. In riches and wisdom. And this is the commentary. Now all the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. Let me read that again. Now all the earth sought the presence of Solomon. Here is God pouring his wisdom into Solomon, so much so that all the earth is attracted. 
And, you know, it's my contention, if I can just slip this in here, that God is attractive. Well, having said that, um, how come he's not attractive to everyone today? Well, religious, religiosity, should I say, um, screws things up. And very often in the church, the pharisaical spirit uh, that exists and the tradition and, as I say, the religiosity, uh, you know, communicates a pretty poor picture of who God really is. But Solomon did a good job there and the whole earth was attracted to him. Amazing. All the earth sought God. So God was using his people, once again, the Jewish people in the Old Testament, to reach all the earth in every generation. Let's jump now from Solomon to Jonah, our seventh example. Jonah is an example of a Jewish prophet now being sent to a Gentile people in the city of Nineveh, which is approximately 400 miles east of Canaan, where Jonah started from. Now, Jonah initially headed out in the wrong direction towards Tarshish or Spain and got caught up in that whole fish story and gets sped up on the coast and then travels all the way um, to Nineveh, reluctantly so, uh, but that's part of the story. And uh, he arrives in Nineveh. Now, the Ninevites were wicked people, incredibly wicked people, and God has to overcome Jonah's reluctance to, to, to get in there. But he does arrive there. And he talks to God and, in fact, um, argues with him a little bit. And we have the reality of that recorded for us. But nevertheless, here in Jonah chapter 4, verse 11, it says, And should I not pity Nineveh, God answering now uh, uh, Jonah and, and expressing some things here to him, should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which, was, uh, which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and, how, and much livestock. So God is, is reaffirming to Jonah that he has a heart for these people who just don't know whether they're coming or going. They're so caught up in their evil. And he, so much so that he sends Jonah all this way, 400 miles uh, east of where he started to land up and preach repentance. And the whole city uh, repented. It's amazing. I mean, Jonah didn't even have to say much, and the whole city repented. Now, incidentally, just as an aside, other prophets were sent to Gentile nations to prophesy God's judgment on them, suggesting that God had revealed to them the truth before the judgment was preached, and that they were accountable for their actions to God. There's the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Jeremiah, the prophet Obadiah, to name three others beside Jonah that were called to prophesy to Gentile nations. So God used his own people to reach out to, to these Gentile nations, uh, showing his heart. Uh, you know, he's not, as I said earlier on, not in the business of trying to um, catch us out quickly and bring down the hammer very quickly of, of judgment, but rather it is to give people an opportunity to repent and turn from their wicked ways and, and come back to him. Let's move along to Daniel now, the Jewish prophet, being used by God as our eighth example to influence a, a mighty king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar in the whole realm of the Babylonians. Now, the Babylonian Empire at that time was a world empire, and King Nebuchadnezzar becomes proud, and Daniel is a Jewish man, prophet, uh, used by God to interpret the king's prophetic dream. And I can't go into all the details of that, but you know, if you know a little bit about the story, that's wonderful. If not, the king had this dream, and uh, uh, it's about uh, beasts and you know exotic things. But essentially, Daniel's interpretation is that the king will be driven from his throne and become like a wild beast eating grass for seven years. His pride brought him to that particular point. And Daniel describes the king's greatness and gives us an insight as to his worldwide influence in chapter 4, in verse 22 of the book that's named after him. He says this, It is you, O king, talking about the dream now, who have grown and become strong. For your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens, and your dominion to the end of the earth. 
So that's how far the reach of King Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian Empire was. He had an impact on the whole earth, the end of the earth. Now, in the end, after the seven-year period where uh, King Nebuchadnezzar is humbled, he's out in the fields eating grass. I mean, it's just from one minute he's, he's king of the castle, and the next minute he's eating grass. But he comes to his senses and blesses and honors God as the Most High God. Now, obviously, it's not God's best to have to do that, but in this case, this is what happened. News of this um, is spread throughout the whole realm by a letter from the king himself. And here we have a record of it in verses 1 to 3 of chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all peoples, this is his letter now, nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. So either this is hyperbole or it's an accurate statement. I happen to believe it's an accurate statement. This letter is going to be sent out to all the earth. I thought it good to declare the signs. This is the content now that's relevant. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are His signs and how mighty His wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and His dominion is from generation to generation. He comes to His senses he glorifies, worships God, and tells everybody in his realm about it. God, through his people, has an influence on the whole world. Moving to Esther now. Queen Esther. She wasn't always a queen, but she certainly became queen um, under the Persian king Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, reign in 519 to 465 BC. He reigned... Interestingly enough, this Persian king, so we've got the Babylonian kingdom and now the Medes and the Persians in the modern day Persia or Iran, which is in the news uh, in 2015. Um, this king, Ahasuerus, reigned from India to Ethiopia, that's in Africa, so India and the Far East, to Ethiopia, and there were 127 provinces under his realm. That's what's found in the record there. But there was a bad character by the name of Haman who mobilized hatred of the Jews in all the realm at that time. And they were going to get smoked by the people who had permission to, to do that to the Jews under Haman's um, you know, evil plot. But Uncle Mordecai, you may have heard of the story, and his niece Esther are used by God to stand in the, in the gap on behalf of all the Jews in the realm. And that's where you get the Feast of the Purim thing come into it, which is celebrated to, to this day in the 21st century. And an edict is granted, eventually now with the favor that Esther gets with the king, that she's now married to, and this edict is given for the Jews to defend themselves. So we pick up the account here in Esther chapter 9, verses 2 to 4, just to focus on the story here. The Jews gather together in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. So that's 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. So the Jews had spread out through that whole area and obviously had taken their understanding of God with them so that the whole realm, the known world at that time, had some appreciation of who God was. And now they're going to witness an incredible deliverance. So the Jews gathered together in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm. And no one could withstand them because fear of them fell upon all people. The people feared the Jews. They, they sensed something special about them. The account goes on here in chapter 9. All the officials of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and all those doing the king's work helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. This is Uncle Mordecai. For Mordecai was great in the king's palace, and his fame th spread throughout all the provinces. For this man, Mordecai, became increasingly uh, prominent. So in the, in the midst of a, an extremely dangerous situation, there were a couple of Jews, Mordecai and Esther, who had an impact on the whole realm in order to bring salvation and deliverance to the Jews. And at the same time, be a witness to everyone around of the goodness of God and his ability to keep his covenant and preserve his people. It's fascinating to, to, to read between the lines and see the impact um, of, of, of God's heart in reaching people in the Old Testament. 
tenth example, moving right along, Nehemiah the prophet. He was now a cupbearer to the Persian king Artaxerxes, which is modern Iran, as we've said before. And he wanted to rebuild the destroyed city walls of Jerusalem. He'd been taken into captivity uh, under Persian rule. This was around about 445 BC, and the Persian Empire stretched over all the Near Eastern world. And Nehemiah actually gets permission to return and rebuild the city walls within the space of two months. It's an incredibly um, uh, supernatural feat, really, to rebuild the city walls within the space of two months. Now, all the governors of the realm knew about it, as Nehemiah had asked that the king give them a heads up that he was coming through their realm. So, here's the passage, Nehemiah chapter 2, from the Old Testament, verses 5 through to 8. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king... And if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. So this is you know, hundreds of miles away from Iran, into, back into modern-day Israel or Palestine or Judah. And furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of, governors of the region beyond the river, that's the Euphrates, that they may permit me to pass through till I come to Ju Judah, and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, for the city wall, and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted to him, granted to, to me, according to all the good hand of my God upon me. So he has a character by the name of Nehemiah, having an incredible um, opportunity afforded to him through the God's favor in his life before this. Uh, Persian king Artaxerxes to go back and rebuild Jerusalem's walls and fix up the temple and and so you, you know the influence and the impact of his life and ministry and the favor that he enjoyed was felt throughout the whole region. I, I'm using it as an example to show you how God's will and heart in reaching the Gentiles is there. The, the witness is there in the midst of all of these circumstances. Number 11, Ruth. She's a Gentile Moabitess. Now the Moabites were to the southeast, more or less, of where modern day um, Israel is. And uh, it was a Gentile nation. And she makes this famous statement to Naomi, her Israelite mother-in-law who had gone there because of famine and problems back, back home. But now they're kind of returning and so Ruth wants to go with her. And she says this, Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. So there's the influence in the Moabite uh, nation. Ruth is aware of this through Naomi. So she leaves her native Moab and goes with Naomi to Israel and eventually, eventually marries eligible Boaz and becomes part of the lineage of Jesus. So, you know, the Gentiles are kind of mixed in to the Jewish uh, history here and lineage of the Messiah, Jesus, too. It's incredible how God's heart of inclusion for the Gentiles around the world at all times is uh, becoming clearer and clearer to me, at least, and hopefully to you, too. Let's look now at our last example, the prophet Amos. He's also recorded in the Old Testament where he boldly proclaim, proclaims God's view an intervention for these Gentile nations. Quote from Amos chapter 9, verse 7. Are not you Israelites the same to me as the Cushites, declares the Lord. So this is God's observation to and through the prophet Amos about Gentile nations. Are not you Israelites the same to me as the Cushites, declares the Lord. Did I not bring Israel up from Egypt, the Philistines from Kaptor, and the Arameans from Kerr, Amos chapter 9, verse 7. Um, so, in short, we can say from that passage, maybe it's unfamiliar to you, but nevertheless, we can say in short that God has had a hand on all sorts of peoples and has positioned them and brought them up to where they are. Now, if we work from the revelation that God loves all people at all times in all places and has a plan for them and has always reached out for them then uh, we can begin to appreciate 
more clearly um, his heart and communicate it to other people who asked the question as we started off this session with, uh, what about the people in? Well, I've just given you 12 examples about what about the people in, in all of those different places in the Old Testament. So in summary now, I've shown you, I believe, that God's heart is to reach all peoples through his chosen people, and his influence has impacted nations and empires, empires throughout Old Testament history all around the world. So you have a reasonable answer to the question, what about the people in? And therefore, it's unwise to judge God's ability to reach all people. He's given us his scripture. He's given us his spirit to explain these things. And so um, it's, it's fair to say that it's reasonable. It's a reasonable conclusion that God loves all people and has loved them at all times. Let me read that concluding text to you, uh, which we started off with, uh, Psalm 98, verses 2 and 3. The Lord has made known His salvation. His righteousness He has revealed in the sight of the nations. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. I hope you enjoyed this session. Thanks for listening.